Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, the media aftermath of the Gaza flotilla story. Troops only fired in self-defense. Competing images, competing narratives. Ten weeks after WikiLeaks released that cockpit video of the Baghdad attack, the alleged source of the leak is arrested. We go inside the Egyptian blogosphere with Wael Abbas. The bloggers, they are taking pictures and videos and posting them online. And BP cleaning up the spill. Oh, my God. From the ridiculous to the sublime. Police often say if they speak to two people who have witnessed the same crime, they routinely hear two quite different accounts. The same thing happens in the media. Two reporters often report the same event to different ways. And when it's a story like the Israeli capture of that Turkish aid shipment to Gaza, the story can get very complicated. There were journalists on board, but they were locked up by the Israeli military for 72 hours after the ship was stormed. So for those crucial first three days of coverage, their stories went untold while the Israelis were free to tell their side of what happened. And during that period, global news channels relied heavily on one piece of footage to tell the story. It was two minutes of video shot, selected and circulated by the Israeli military. Our starting point this week is the early morning raid in the Mediterranean. The videos and accounts of what happened that are still coming out and the ongoing attempts by both sides to control the narrative and get their version of the story out to domestic and global news audiences. This news story was all about the pictures, the images that Israel wanted the world to see. The country's military has been quick to broadcast its version of events, but... And the footage it tried to suppress. In the initial round of coverage, there were two pieces of video used by the global media to tell the flotilla story. A satellite report from Al Jazeera's Jamal El Shayal. Well, our reporter sent this report before communications were cut. They raised the white flag. Um, this after Israeli commandos descended upon the ship. And video the Israeli military produced and made available to broadcasters everywhere. The Israeli Navy claims self-defense, releasing this video to support their case. There were many other cameras and video phones on board, but for the first three days after the raid, when the ship's passengers were in Israeli custody, none of that video was seen anywhere. The Israeli army didn't release any of the footage that the journalists like us filmed. For example, I personally filmed three people who were injured um, and remained critically injured for three hours and ultimately died. So I filmed the last moments of these three people whose lives could have been saved but weren't. Why hasn't that footage been released? It wasn't released because Israel did not want the world to see evidence that could be used to disprove Israel's version of events. The version that said that Israeli soldiers killed only in self-defense. They were mobbed, they were clubbed, they were uh, beaten. The Israeli government wanted the global media to use its pictures, the ones that backed up its story. They released two one-minute edited tapes. They had hours and hours of footage of uh, what went down on that ship, and they released only two minutes of it. That leads me to believe that only two minutes of it were positive for them, and the rest of it shows a disaster on board that does not help the Israeli Defense Forces at all. The military-produced video did not show how and when the activists were shot, although the Israeli helicopter's infrared cameras would have easily recorded the flashes caused by gun discharges. Instead, the IDF has selectively released only a portion of the tape that showed its commandos under attack, but has omitted the killings. What makes me angry, troubled, is the American media reaction. Israel's claim, backed by its military video, is that troops only fired in self-defense when they were attacked and beaten by activists begging for a fight. They give almost no context. One sailor thrown onto a lower deck. If you're a media organization, first of all, you should say, hey, those two minutes are interesting, but we demand all the tapes. If you don't release all the tapes, we at the very least have to say, every time we cover that story, these are the only edited tapes released by the Israeli Defense Forces and do not represent all of what happened on that ship. Did we get that in the American media? Hell no. The Israeli military took the passengers into custody and locked them up along with their videotapes. With the witnesses, many of them journalists, silenced, it was left to Israeli government spokespeople who had been nowhere near the ship 
to explain what happened on board. The hardcore extremists on the boat used violence in it, and our soldiers who were in the operation uh, had to defend themselves. The passengers on this flotilla chose in a violent manner, in a violent way, they prepared themselves for this violence against our soldiers. And when the journalists were finally freed, 72 hours after being captured, most of them emerged from custody empty-handed. There's also questions, why was everything confiscated? Journalists' materials were confiscated. Everyone who was on the boat had their phones, their cameras, recording devices confiscated. So only the IDF story is going out, and that's very troublesome. You know, the lack of transparency is very troublesome. Israel always claims uh, that it is a democracy and it cares for freedom of speech. But the fact that all the footage was taken, we were searched several times. Some people who tried to hide uh, memory chips in their shoes and in their socks, once they were found, were strip searched. Everything that was done was done purely to ensure that no one, no one on board that ship could get away with any evidence whatsoever of ultimately what can only be described as the atrocity that Israel committed on board that ship. We requested and were refused an interview with Abital Leibovitz, the Israeli military spokesperson. Israel's media machine is very good at spinning news stories, but on this occasion was unwilling to discuss its practices. Did the Israeli government manage to spin the story? Internally, yes, as was evident with the Israeli public reaction to the event. We saw how they went out to cheer and celebrate their commandos' actions on the streets of Tel Aviv and their attacks on foreign reporters, especially Al Jazeera's crew. But externally, no. I feel that the Israeli public is really buying into the footage that's being released, everything that's being released. I don't see a lot of questioning going on, and I think that's a pity. People don't really seem to be interrogating what the information they're receiving. And it seems at this point that the Israeli government doesn't care what the international you know, community thinks. We're joined here in New York by filmmaker and activist Yara Lee. This past week, a journalist, a Brazilian-American, revealed that she smuggled one videotape off the ship. Her equipment was confiscated, but she did manage to have smuggled out an hour's worth of footage. It captured the chaos on board, the desperate treatment of the wounded and of the dying. One of those being treated by a passenger was an Israeli soldier. This video told a different story, but was it the full story? Were there other shots that had been edited out? That's the thing about news on television. It's not just what gets on the air that matters. Sometimes the truth lies in images we never see. And here's how our Global Village voices see the media coverage of the flotilla story. There was huge media attention around the incident. The Israeli state was not able to control and monopolize the information flows of these kinds of actions. And I think there's increased public pressure against uh, these kind of actions by the Israeli state. For Israel, it has definitely been a PR disaster. They were trying to spin the story of the Freedom Flotilla, pretending that their soldiers were defending themselves against a bunch of terrorists but it just didn't work. Online activists are definitely learning, and Israel will not be given a free reign anymore. Time now for some Listening Post news bites. The repercussions are still rippling out from that WikiLeaks story, the release of the video of the 2007 helicopter attack in Iraq that killed more than a dozen civilians, including two Reuters journalists. Bradley Manning, an American soldier who allegedly gave that video to the online whistleblowing website, was arrested in late May and is being held in Kuwait. Reports are now coming out that the Pentagon is also searching for Julian Assange, the co-founder of WikiLeaks. According to Wired.com, Manning claimed he had also given Assange about 260,000 confidential U.S. diplomatic cables and intelligence documents. Now, according to the DailyBeast.com website, the Pentagon wants to get to Assange before he can post those documents on his site. But finding Julian Assange will not be easy. As the Australian network SPS1 recently reported, Assange spends most of his time on the move, splitting his time between at least three countries, never staying more than six weeks in any one location, and running his site from a laptop that he carries in his backpack. 
It's been a year since Iran descended into post-election chaos, and the authorities there are once again disrupting broadcast signals into the country, one channel in particular, the U.S.-funded Voice of America. VOA recently aired a documentary on Neda Aga Sultan, the young woman who was fatally shot on June 20th last year, eight days into the protests, and became a martyr to the opposition cause, largely because of global media coverage. But when Iranians tuned in to watch the dock, VOA's channel was blocked, its signal jammed, and in some places the electricity was reportedly cut off. HBO then posted the video online, and it's been racking up the hits there ever since. The media war in Venezuela between the Chavez government and privately owned opposition television channels is not letting up. The government has issued an arrest warrant for Guillermo Zuloaga, the majority shareholder and president of Global Vision TV. The charge is over financial irregularities, but may have had more to do with some comments that Zuluaga made earlier this year when he accused President Hugo Chavez of ordering troops to open fire against opposition protesters during the attempted coup back in 2002. On June 3rd, Chavez made a speech saying, quote, let Zuluaga go to any other country and say the president ordered someone killed, they'd put him in jail immediately, unquote. This past January, Chavez's government forced another blatantly anti-government channel, RCTV, off the air. RCTV had supported the anti-democratic coup against Chavez in 2002 and eventually lost its broadcasting license. There's a story coming out of France that suggests that President Nicolas Sarkozy is flexing his media muscle again. And it could land this web journalist, Augustin Scalbert, in prison for up to five years. Scalbert works for a news website, rue89.com, which posted a video of Monsieur Sarkozy. It shows the president, back in 2008, preparing to be interviewed on a national network, France 3. He makes a few remarks about not being greeted properly by one of the network's technicians, and he implies that as a result, things are going to change. Well, on pas dans le public. After the video went viral, charges were laid against Scalbert and the technician who allegedly leaked him the video. Critics say that the French authorities acted to appease the president, who has been known to use his influence with media outlets across the country. We're back after the break with a feature interview with one of the most daring voices in the Arabic blogosphere, Wa'el Abbas of Egypt. Welcome back. We're reaching into the Listening Post archives this week for an interview on one of the most important new media developments in the Arab world. We're going to talk about the Egyptian blogosphere, all of the voices making themselves heard through new technology on the state of politics and other social issues there. Egypt has the best developed political blogosphere of any Arabic-speaking society, and as such, it's a bit of a laboratory that tests the limits of freedom of expression in that country and also sets the pace for other online political activists across the Middle East. The man we're speaking to is Wael Abbas. He is a thorn in the side of the Mubarak government in Cairo and its security forces. Through his site, Misra Digital or Egyptian Awareness, Abbas is as influential as any political blogger is anywhere. Wael Abbas now on the Egyptian blogosphere. What has changed in Egypt as a result of bloggers, what hasn't, and why he is not a big fan of either Facebook or YouTube. Thanks for talking to us here at the Listening Post. You're welcome. My pleasure. How would you describe your relationship with the Egyptian authorities at the moment? Well, it's bad, but they are not uh, saying that uh, clearly. But they are giving me a hard time. In what ways? Stopping me in the airport, tabbing my phone, leaking information about me, spreading rumors not allowing me to get a job or even to do freelance journalism that I'm doing. So it's really bad. We know that every once in a while you get in trouble with the authorities. Yeah. But we're not clear why you're not always in trouble with them. That gray area. For instance, why aren't you in jail right now? I don't really know, but there was a good opportunity that I go to jail several times before, but I managed to escape, I managed to run, I managed to hide. There were arrest warrants against me several times. What don't they like about you? That I don't want to stop, that I'm critical of them, that I'm exposing them, causing them lots of scandals, especially the police force and the torture. Uh, I'm very critical of the regime, and uh, I speak about that inside of Egypt and outside of Egypt, which like makes them uh, more angry that I speak about that outside Egypt. Wael says threatening phone calls did soon come, but he kept up the pressure 
and early this year grabbed global attention by posting this. It is a brutal sight on the floor, 21-year-old Imad Kabir. The security forces in particular have a problem with you ever since you posted that video, that torture video. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, the authorities had to act on it. They ended up convicting... Yeah, there was a, there was a trial and the two officers were convicted and they were sent to jail. And but it's the first president of its kind. But beyond that, yeah. is there any evidence that the security forces are behaving differently as a result, perhaps? No, there's no difference. They're just covering up. Because there are no orders from above to tell them to stop doing what they're doing. Like uh, the, the Minister of Interior, for example, issued an order uh, to ban the use of mobile phones inside police stations. So this is the reaction. We don't want anything to be filmed. But he didn't issue an order to stop torture. Although that you know that there are torture rooms all over Egypt in every single police station, big or small. This week, Egypt, the Mubarak government, the internet, and the demands that a blogger be released from jail. Karim Amr was the first blogger to be convicted and sent to jail in Egypt. He's still in jail, isn't he? He's still in jail. Can you give us an idea of what kind of impact that very public trial has had on the output of the blogosphere? Did it change things? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Because the bloggers back then, they were really active. And they knew that this trial was just to intimidate them and to make an example of Karim Amr, to frighten the rest of the bloggers, so they didn't swallow the bait. Can you explain to me why it is that the Egyptian blogosphere leads the league, so to speak, in the Arab world? Why is it a noisier place than in some other Arab countries that perhaps might have similar political situations? Because the bloggers are not only working on the internet, they are not like bloggers in pajamas, sitting in their comfy bedrooms and writing stuff. They are on the street. They, are, they have their own cameras and they are taking pictures and videos and posting them online. So this is, this is the difference. And they are using the real names and they are uh, delivering news service to people. They are giving people news that they won't get anywhere else. People keep on talking about the transition yeah. beyond Hosni Mubarak, the political transition and what will follow. What role do you see bloggers like yourself playing during that process? Well, we don't know yet. It depends on the situation then. But I think that security are afraid of specific stuff that we might be doing, like the stuff we did back in 2005 and 2006. And I took this picture, and here the officer is shouting as a soldier, soldiers to uh, get uh, me. We exposed a lot, a lot of rigging, a lot of thuggery, a lot of the use of security to uh, prevent people from going to the polling stations, bribery, uh, stuff like that. Lots of bloggers in Egypt at the moment are afraid that there is going to be a wave of arrests among bloggers to prevent them from doing the part they are playing. And some of them are saying that they are going to be covering it from home. Wael clocks a million hits per month on MosserDigital.com. I think it was in 07. I think it was CNN was calling you, I think, Middle Eastern Person of the Year. I think BBC described you as one of the most influential people out there. Do you feel influential? I hope that I, that I am. I want things to change. I want uh, real uh, free press. Uh, I want to push the envelope of freedom of expression. One of the reasons we started blogging was that the traditional media wasn't doing its job. And uh, uh, they were lazy and they were afraid and they, they had a lot of self-censorship. So we covered stories that they, they were, didn't dare to cover. Every once in a while we look at your YouTube account. Sometimes it's there, then it disappears, then it comes back. What's going on? YouTube claims that I violate their terms of service and I publish videos that are not suitable uh, for, for them because I publish videos of torture. Did you talk to them about it? I talked to them and they ignored me, but only they responded when the media started calling them. And the story was out there on CNN, on Fox News, on other media outlets. Facebook has a problem with you, too. Yeah. Recently, I started this group on Facebook in solidarity with one blogger who was arrested by the government, and he was accused of terrorism because he went to Gaza, and he met some people from Hamas. We posted those photos of us uh, holding those uh, toy plastic machines. I remember guns. that story. Facebook obviously didn't like that because we're Arabs, we're Egyptians, and we're dark-skinned, and 
we're holding guns, so we're inciting violence here. But if you go to Facebook and put the word gun, you won't believe the amount of photos and the amount of groups that you're gonna get. Like there are, there are fan pages for machine guns for AK-47. But if you're an Egyptian, if you're an Arab, if you're from the Middle East, it's not allowed. You're violent, even if it's a toy gun that is shooting uh, uh, like plastic pebbles or something. Did you talk to Facebook about that? Yeah, but they never restored, they never answered and they never restored the group. A lot of people in a lot of countries blog anonymously. You don't want to do that. Why not? I don't want to do that because I want to encourage people to join us. I want to encourage people to move. I want them to follow us, but not to feel suspicious of us. I want them to know who we are and that we are here and that we are living, we live in Egypt and that we're not afraid and they should do the same. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Well, Al Abbas, thanks for talking to us. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Finally, it's not a great time to be an oil executive at BP. The Gulf of Mexico deep sea gusher has spread onto the coastlines of four American states. BP's stock prices are tanking, and President Obama is threatening to emote, if necessary, on the American news networks if that's what it takes to stop his own leaking poll numbers. Big news stories inevitably become fodder for American comedians. The Upright Citizens Brigade runs comedy theaters in New York and Los Angeles, and it's wondering if BP execs are any better at handling small spills than they are at handling big ones. Their video has already attracted more than three million hits on YouTube. It's a newsworthy web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Don't worry about it. It's, it's a small spill on a very large table. Yeah, that's a lot of coffee. Well, we'd better hurry up because it's almost reached my laptop. Calm down. Calm down. Boom. It's also going to destroy all the fish. Oh, boy. Okay. Boom. Look at that. Oh, oh no. Fish. Laptop. Okay. Ah. okay. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no. Fish. Wait, wait, wait. I've got a brilliant idea. Damn. Didn't work. Oh my god, look. Garbage will fall into the coffee cups, stopping further spillage. Yeah, there's just coffee and garbage. A gentleman from Halliburton here? Send him out. Gentlemen, we've Oh my god! You guys are partly responsible for this. Oh no, 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 no. Don't don't put this on us. You know what? Halliburton doesn't have to listen to this. We are out of here. Oh!